Hello and welcome back to the Coin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to leading voices in Bitcoin and macroeconomics about their origin stories, Bitcoin headlines and news topics, and this movement to fix the world by fixing the money. This podcast does not provide financial advice. Before I share this week's episode, here are some messages from my sponsors who make this show possible. First of all, are you ready for Bitcoin 2023? I certainly am. This year's Bitcoin conference was absolutely amazing. I got to spend a week in Miami with tens of thousands of Bitcoiners from around the world. And I'm so grateful that I had the chance to anchor Bitcoin Magazine's live desk and MC the main stage. If you missed the event, you can catch all three days of incredible Bitcoin content over on Bitcoin Magazine's YouTube channel. And also, it's never too early to start making plans to attend the next conference. Bitcoin 2023 tickets are already available and super early bird rates do not last long. So you can visit b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and secure your pass before prices increase. This show is also powered by OKCoin, my favorite place to DCA without the crazy fees. OKCoin recently launched an amazing initiative called Crypto for All, which is aimed at democratizing knowledge and access to Bitcoin. OKCoin is one of the fastest growing and most secure global cryptocurrency exchanges that serves all your needs for Bitcoin and is committed to investing in educational content, funding crypto developers and entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups, and helping more diverse talent work on crypto ecosystem projects and careers. OKCoin has actually contributed more than a million dollars to Bitcoin core devs and counting, has one of the most active lightning nodes and recently launched Sats mode. You can head to go.okcoin.com slash Natalie and receive $10 in Bitcoin when you sign up. I am so excited to share my guest today live in person is Adam Back. He's a cryptographer. He is one of the OG cypherpunks. He was one of the first people, actually the first, to message with Satoshi Nakamoto and he's the CEO of Blockstream. So Adam, thank you so much for joining me here at Bitcoin 2022. Thanks for having me on. It's great to uh, see in-person events picking up again. Yeah, so let's start all the way at the beginning. That's what I do for Coin Stories. So I know you're from London, England. So tell me a little bit about where you're from and your upbringing there. Uh, yeah, well, I moved around quite a bit. So um, I actually went to university in Exeter, which is about 200 miles west of London. And then moved around with my career as well. Like uh, lived in Canada for a while, in the US for a while, and more recently in Malta, actually. And so when you were a kid, I mean, tell me what growing up was like. Were you middle class, upper class? Were, were your parents working all the time? Did you have a concept for money when you were young? Um, yeah, my parents were working. Um, and I was quite interested, I mean, in, in sciences like mathematics and physics. And so I did well in those subjects, but also was interested in economics. So I studied economics at A-level, which is like 16 to 18 in the UK. And so I was already thinking in sort of free market terms and did some uh, kind of day trading, stock trading when I was a bit older as well. So um, kind of an eclectic mixture of interests actually. And my, my uh, computer science PhD was in distributed systems and also spent much of my career doing cryptography, like applied cryptography for internet security. So Bitcoin for me is, um, you know, it's, it's a nice mixture of everything I'm interested in, basically, you know, trading, economics, crypto protocols. Uh, actually, my previous startup to uh, Blockstream was um, some peer-to-peer -peer networking uh, project as well. So, Were your parents involved in computer science, engineering, math? No, not at all. <laughs> what did they do? Um, my father was like um, in uh, business as a, a manager of uh, like larger uh, department stores and things like that. So I read that you kind of reverse engineered video games and you were working with computers kind of pretty much your whole life. What, what drew you to them? What drew you to basically this industry and being technical? Um, yeah, I guess as a teenager, like about 12 or 13, I got uh, one of the early computers, uh, ZX81, which is a kind of, um, I mean, you had to use a TV screen for a monitor, and uh, it didn't have like a hard drive, it had a tape drive, but you could program it, and I taught myself to program on it, and then I like, found that interesting, and so kept doing that, and when I came to university, decided I would do computer science to, you know, 
learn more and do more in that area. At the time, obviously, Bitcoin didn't exist. What was your goal? What, what did you want to do with computer science? Um, it was just something that interested me, kind of a, an interesting domain to get involved with if you're you know, good at mathematics and physics and interested in kind of building things and constructing things with it. Um, and uh, I mean, in terms of electronic cash and privacy technology, I got exposed to that at university. Uh, uh, a master student when I was doing my PhD, a friend of mine was doing a project on RSA encryption, so he was trying to make it faster on distributed computers. And so I knew what RSA was through that, you know, inf informal conversations with uh, this guy. And what is RSA? Uh, uh, it's, it's a public key, one of the early public key cryptography systems for digital signatures and encryption. And so that's one of the building, well, I mean, not actually RSA, but an alternative to RSA that came later called DSA that's used by Bitcoin. And so um, not long after that, PGP was released. And you know, pretty that, good privacy. Exactly right. So uh, encryption that people could use for email and encrypting files. And so that had um, an interesting new dynamic, which is it could sort of change the balance of power between the establishment and the individual, that the individual could communicate for a very strong privacy at a distance. And so I, I thought that was a really interesting kind of mix of computer science technology and like individual sovereignty or something like that. So I got hooked on that kind of area and found the cypherpunks list where people were talking about other things related to that, like privacy technology, electronic cash, and uh, so that's, that's where I got uh, more interested in applied cryptography and um, I was running a remailer which is a bit of privacy technology to be able to send emails uh, anonymously and um, one of the problems with that was spam. So people would send spam through remailers and, and email spam as well was pretty bad at that point. And so there's this kind of interesting combination because remailers are anonymous, the usual anti-spam techniques don't work. Normally people would just block the senders of, of spam, but because it's anonymous you don't know who the sender is by design. And so, you know, sort of dealing with this spam problem, I uh, got to thinking about what, whether there was another way to combat spam. And so that's where Hashcash came from, which many years later was adopted by Bitcoin as a proof of work. Yes, okay, so I want to learn more obviously about Hashcash, but before we get to that, the impression that I get when I learn about your background is that you would identify essentially problems within your computer science background and try to figure out the solutions. Is that sort of how it works? You kind of, you, you recognize an issue that needs to be fixed and then you try to figure out a way to solve it? Yeah, well I mean the, the problems that I thought would be interesting are those with uh, positive social impact for individual sovereignty and things like that. So, and I, because I was interested in applied cryptography, I got quite proficient at and inventive at finding solutions. So I find something that was a known problem with no easy solution and try and find an inventive new solution. And a lot of the time there is no solution, so you, you don't get anywhere. But, you know, occasionally you find something new. Uh, the hash cache is one of those. Is this something that you feel like you were always naturally good at, or you just really worked hard and you were able to, you know, devise some of the things you created? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I noticed actually more recently that a lot of the people that are cryptographers who did things related to privacy were actually motivated by the social benefit of it. So in, in other words, they had a mission, and so they worked very hard and were very motivated. And so they weren't, you know, they weren't doing cryptography just because it was a cool mathematical thing or to publish papers for curiosity, but they actually were trying to find a solution that was good for you know, society or something like that. So I had the same kind of outlook actually. Well, let's dig into that because you talk about you know, social benefit and the idea of individual sovereignty. Why was that important to you as an early cryptographer? Um, I think people were recognizing that, you know, this is the early days of internet mass adoption and they were recognizing that in practice you had less privacy online than you had offline. And you would have some 
sort of regulatory or legal rights to privacy and freedom of association, but in practice the ISPs were logging everything, and so you didn't, you weren't able to get the rights that laws and societal norms said you should have, and so the cypherpunks had thought about this problem, and there was a lot of discussion about it, to say, well, maybe what we need to do is to build technical solutions so that you can assert your rights online and regain the privacy that you have in the offline world. So that was the idea. Wow. So you went to the University of Exeter and then you were kind of consulting at startups for your first jobs? Or like, how did your career actually develop and, and how did you come to create Hashcash? Um, so, yeah, I, I was uh, working in like a mixture of startups and bigger companies. So basically do a startup, get acquired by a uh, previous startup, PyCorp was acquired by EMC, so I worked for EMC for a while. Then I got more and more interested in Bitcoin and started Blockstream after that. And so, you know, Hashcash was much earlier, of course, that was uh, in 1997. So I was working um, in a kind of mixture of academic and commercial uh, healthcare, privacy and security uh, domain at that time. Well, so tell us about it. I mean, how did you, what is Hashcash for people that aren't familiar? It's basic, the building blocks, right, before Bitcoin. And how did you come to create it? Uh, so there was, there was a spam problem I was talking about. And um, it occurred to me that the problem, like the fundamental problem, if you, it was that email is approximately free. So there was no cost to send. And of course, to, to actually make a payment, you know, with PayPal or at this time it's before PayPal, so like a credit card merchant processing, it's very difficult for an individual to be able to receive a payment and to get a credit card merchant processing account. That's an onerous thing. And a lot of people wouldn't necessarily have a way to do that. A lot of internet users were in emerging markets without access to credit cards or banking. So it occurred to me that you could, you could do a subset and that might be good enough, which is you create a cost without being electronic cash. And so Hashcash was basically a digital postage stamp where the sender would um, you know, use some cycles on their computer to do some work to create a stamp and the recipient could uh, verify it very cheaply. So it was, it was sort of tuned to take like a minute or so on a laptop or something like that. What component of that has evolved into Bitcoin mining essentially? Yeah, so I mean, Hashcash got used for a few different internet protocol things. So often when something new is released or becomes known to developers, people find like a, a range of uses. And so it was used for other sort of denial of service things, you know, so like to create a pseudonym or an account, you'd have to do some work or um, just just to deal with that kind of problem. So, so I mean, it, it was it was used for uh, the anti-spam, for pseudonym, for account creation, for click fraud, you know, so people would get paid for the clicks they achieve on a website and there was a problem with automated click fraud, so some creative people used, made the uh, clicker's browser do some work so that it, would, it wouldn't be so easy to automate. So a lot of creative things like that and actually when Hashcash was released it seemed to spontaneously cause a lot of people to think about um, it being a bit like digital gold, basically. So it seems to occur to multiple people within like a few days of it being released for the anti-spam purpose that maybe this could be the basis for electronic cash. And there was a context which is people were very interested in electronic cash for payment privacy. And the then system uh, by DigiCash um, was centralized and had failed when the when that company uh, went bankrupt, basically. It was a centralized database, and so when that company went out of business, all electronic cash coins became unverifiable. Oh, wow. And so, the I guess one of the challenges was those that electronic cash system was a bit like a, what we would call a stable coin today. Oh, okay. It's expected that they would try to get a relationship with a bank and be able to take your bank deposit, convert it into a respendable coin, and deposit it back later after respending. And so I think the, the idea arose from that that um, because you could mine to create coins, you could have a free-floating electronic cash system that didn't have a direct banking 
reliance or interface. It's just a kind of free market value. Did you have a vision at the time that we could create this sort of decentralized network that could potentially serve as a new form of money and even further, you know, global reserve asset, uh, an asset that countries are now holding in reserves? Well, I mean, it's, I think it depends who you talk to. So some people were interested in the privacy and the payment side of it, and others were uh, gold, like physical gold enthusiasts. So they were looking at monetary reform, return to a gold standard. But so I think Bitcoin has more of the store of value gold story and investment asset story. At that time, people were more trying to find a solution to um, the reliance on a banking relationship and to make it decentralized. But certainly there were discussions in 97, 98 about how to make such a proof of work based electronic cash system decentralized. And um, Bitgold by Nick Szabo and B-Money by Weidai were kind of design outlines that were in 1998 already, which you know sounds superficially Bitcoin-like but without details filled in and with some unsolved problems. Were you yourself thinking about monetary reform or thinking that something is fundamentally wrong with the system that I want to try to create solutions for? Um, nor with the electronic cash. I mean, I was certainly aware of um, inflation as a headwind for investment because I was day trading and looking at you know inflation rates and reading about consumer price indexes being kind of artificially low and. You know, there's a real prospect that you can think you are making an investment but actually going backwards in real terms. So I was aware of all of that, but I wasn't so much thinking about uh, financial reform. I think, I think Nick Zabo probably was a little more from that background or viewpoint. But I think, to my perspective, it was just more coincidental that the proof of work solved um, a need for a banking partnership to deploy something, because the interesting thing was to have an electronic cash system that was usable and deployed and adoptable by people. And needing a banking partnership would be a barrier to that. And you know, people had seen DigiCash uh, you know, fail, probably mostly because of centralization and just banking reliance. So having a solution to the banking reliance, and then of course, because it would necessarily be kind of free market, it would have a free floating exchange rate. Um, and you know, a number of problems weren't solved. So at that time, there was concern about um, whether it would be hyperinflationary because you know, if you could do work to create coins, then people right. would go wild and do that. And so, you know, both B Money and Bitgold have ideas about how to sort of have a market set a rate of supply, which was not like programs in like a supply curve like Bitcoin had, but it was an early concepts in the same area. Well, it's so interesting because all of these kind of components and solutions come together eventually to create Bitcoin. And I wanted to I wanted to offer you the chance to share that perspective for people, especially those that are new in the space of you hear crypto today as if it's a new technology, like brand new, right? And you hear the word crypto conflated with every type of currency, every coin. But really, this is like 40 years of research and development in computer science, right? Can you offer some more perspective on just how much work it took before Satoshi Nakamoto could create Bitcoin? Well, I mean, Bitcoin is using a number of different kind of applied crypto things like digital signatures and hash functions and proof of work. But it's also using um, very few of them, which is the right thing to do because if you use very recent cryptography, it's less, it's typically less secure or less trustable because um, the way, generally the way to find out if a new cryptography thing is secure is for some years of peer review and that nobody's broken it and people have analyzed it and so on. So you don't want to use, ideally you don't want to use something that was just invented like you know, last year. And so Bitcoin actually does that quite well. I mean, in the sense that, you know, the hash functions are very old thing. Digital signatures, I mean, there was an evolution from RSA to DSA to elliptic curve DSA, but it used the current de facto norm that people would use. And yeah, so everything is quite conservative, but of course those building blocks date back, you know, digital signatures to the 1970s or something originally and hash functions and things also. 
So take me back to that first exposure to Bitcoin. And obviously, what I mentioned earlier, you were the first person to actually communicate online with Satoshi Nakamoto. Yeah, so he sent me an email about um, Hashcash, basically. So my impression is he'd already built Bitcoin. This was in like August 2008. So I think he had already implemented it and was writing a draft of the paper. And so he wanted to cite things correctly. So he was asking how he should cite Hashcash. So I gave him the information and exchanged a few emails about related electronic cash systems that used proof of work or um, uh, in particular, I pointed him to B-Money, which he didn't seem to be aware of. Oh, he wasn't aware of B-Money? It didn't seem like it, of, of B-Money, yeah. Um, which is, you know, Bitcoin-like. Anyway, so he cited that and contacted Wei Dai, who was the author of that. Um, and, yeah, so, you know, and then scroll forwards uh, to 2009. There's another email that he's released the, the source code and, like, activity on the mailing list, like the cryptography related mailing lists about uh, Bitcoin and people trying it out and uh, commenting on it. I mean, Hal Finney in particular had tried it out, I think received the first Bitcoin transaction ever and wrote um, a summary about uh, the experience, like how it worked, yeah. explaining it, which I thought, was, which I read and thought was like a useful summary of how it works. So basically, in those early days, there was one mailing list and all of you kind of found each other through it because you were all working on cryptography projects all over the world? Uh, yeah, I mean, the people would just look for where the conversation, where like-minded people having conversation about similar topics were. And at the time, there was the cypherpunks list and also the cryptography list, which was uh, more kind of... Uh, applied crypto focused like cypherpunks was a bit more was also like technical but more about the social impact and could range into politics and arguments more whereas the cryptography list was uh, moderated which was annoying because it's kind of form of censorship but um, you know it was a bit more business or applied focus and I think Bitcoin was actually released on the cryptography list and not on the cypherpunks list actually. Did you communicate a lot with Satoshi or it was just the, those first couple emails and then yeah. Probably like half a dozen emails or something like that, not very much, yeah. Any impression? Well, I mean, when I, f I have some like open source software and papers online at that time, and occasionally you'd get an email like every month or two from somebody asking about something, you know, like I'm using this, or what do you think about this, or here's a link to the paper I wrote that, you know, uses what you built before. And so I, it felt like just another one of those, and I didn't realize that Satoshi Nakamoto wasn't the guy's, like, was a pseudonym, right? Because it's just like, okay, that's his name, right? So. Did you use a pseudonym as well? Everybody no. used pseudonyms or no? No. I mean, there, there were people on the Cypunks list using pseudonyms to publish software or discuss because they were interested in privacy and anonymity and operating remailers and things like that, and so they would. Uh, practice what they were talking about, so they would use it. And so there was certainly some technical discussion about electronic cash on the Cypunks list over the years, pre-Bitcoin, that were anonymous or pseudonymous. Yeah. Okay. What is the difference between a cryptographer and a cypherpunk? Um, well, I think cypherpunk is the idea and the concepts that achieving societal change by technology is a um, is a more practical thing to do. Um, and you can, you can see a version of it which people may, may be more familiar with Skype, uh, like voice over IP, before that was as popular, that telephony is a very regulated area. So the idea for a software company to just make a, a free VoIP app would upset a lot of telephony companies, regu like telephony regulators, and many of the telephone companies were government owned. But the way Skype did it is they just released the software. They didn't ask for, you know, telephony regulatory approval. They just did it and, you know, asked for forgiveness later. So the Cypherpunk viewpoint was very much like that. Like, let's just build it and deploy it. And if lots of people use it, the regulators can catch up later. Uh, whereas if you ask for permission up front, I don't know, they won't understand what you're talking about or they'll just say no because it sounds scary or novel. Um, whereas the cryptography is a kind of, um, computer science specialization, and there's, there's a bit of a difference between 
mathematical or academic cryptographers and applied cryptographers who were trying to build uh, systems, software systems. And so your choices are different for applied cryptography than academic cryptography. And academic cryptography is trying to discover new things at the bleeding edge, so they'll do risky things which are not yet safe to use, and some of which never become, like, become broken or something. So I was always more interested in the applied cryptography because I was interested in building things that people could use safely. Okay, so take me back to when the Satoshi white paper, paper was released. Were you, did you get it from the moment it came out? Like, what did you think? Take me back to that moment. Um, well, I think myself and a lot of people initially thought that its privacy was a lot weaker than the kind of gold standard at the time for electronic cash. So there was a kind of fairly long history at that point of electronic cash protocols. Uh, the original one was in 1985. So. You know, there's like 12 years, I guess, between that time. And those electronic cash systems were highly private, like, you know, uh, blind signatures, uh, very good privacy, so you couldn't link two payments as being from the same person, that kind of thing. But they were centralized. And so people would judge any new electronic cash protocol against that idealized assumption that it should be private and it should, you know, should have all these specific properties. And Bitcoin didn't largely, right? I mean, it's sort of pseudonymous, you know, you could probably link the transactions, but there was no identity. And so the linkability was a problem to people. And also because it was decentralized and the proof of work system, it seemed, you know, it seemed like a weaker security model because whoever had more hash rate could potentially overwhelm and undo transactions and things like that. So people were used to a much more uh, asymmetric security guarantee where the um, uh, the attacker would have to spend an unreasonable amount of uh, uh, computation to overwhelm it. But their assumption was it was centralized and you should trust the central server. So, so I think you know, it took people a while to get used to this shift and, and my thought process evolved to say, well, okay, it's, it's privacy is not so good, but it is decentralized, and we saw that the highly private but centralized things fail. People were already interested in, you know, back in 97, 98, in figuring out a way to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here's something that's decentralized, but doesn't have the privacy. So I just like, kind of, at some point, turned my attention to trying to improve the privacy, of right. it, which is where confidential transactions came from in that area. Wow. I just can't believe that you know you're you're one of the OG people who saw this when it was being born, and you saw the potential of it, and you had the the knowledge and the technical you know wherewithal to contribute. I mean, do you sometimes think about that about how life changing those moments were back then in 2009, 10? Yeah, I mean, it's it was you know of course the history of it is um, that. It was, it's, you know, to people who looked at it at the time, it seemed uncertain. So I listened to a podcast by Dustin Trammell, who apparently was mining in 2009, and then got bored and went off and did something else for a while, right? And, and, and that's just basically, there was no nowhere to spend it, very few users, no, pri no quotable price, no exchange. And so like the flavor from, I mean, I, I wasn't actively involved or using it at that time, right? So, but the flavor that he was describing is that, you know, it's kind of geeky, hobbyist, people interested in the technical curiosity. And so I think it, it was significantly uncertain if it would bootstrap at all, right? And uh, I spoke with actually at some point, maybe 2013 with um, somebody with a, economics training, monetary economics training, who was saying that it, it, Bitcoin is kind of unique in that it bootstraps without having, um, you know, a, a commodity under it, right? So normally the other, like the, the government issued fiat currency started life with a collectible or a commodity that, that became a currency afterwards, but Bitcoin didn't, it kind of grew organically. So. Apparently that is relatively unique as well. So did you start mining it right away? And no, what happened? I, did, I didn't might start mining until like 2013 or something. Why? Well, I mean, like I said, you know, my, my question, I mean, I was interested to see if it would bootstrap because, you know, it solved some 
previously unsolved problems, but the uncertainty of whether it would bootstrap was like, so I was like, well, let's see if it bootstraps, like kind of wait and see kind of thing. And so how Finney was more of, um, so maybe a, a bit more content to understand and think about it without, you know, playing with it to understand it, right? So some people like to learn things by playing with them and other people just want to like, okay, I want to understand it and I don't need to play with it. So how Finney was more hands-on and did some mining for a while and stuff like that. But I mean, there are lots of people who did mining who stopped mining after a while because it was, you know, heating up their laptop or, you know, just crazy stuff. And of course today, you know, everybody has their regrets about should have mined, should have started, should have bought earlier, et cetera, et cetera. So. so when did you have maybe an aha moment where you thought, oh, Bitcoin, this is it. This could fix a lot of problems. I need to get involved in this and have it. Well, I was kind of waiting for the bootstrap moment. And so, um, and that, like I start, you start to see bits of news like that I noticed in 2013. Of course, there were like TV segments in 2012, which I didn't see at the time, but, um, and it went, it went through some milestones that popped up on like general tech news, like it went through a dollar and then it went through a hundred dollar and they're like, oh, wait a minute, that's, that kind of has bootstrapped, right? I mean, that's a lot of money, even in market cap terms at that time. And so then I got like more actively involved in trying to understand all of the technical details. If you could think back, or if you could have a conversation with the earlier Adam back when he was working on some of this back in 2013, what would you tell him? Buy more Bitcoin. Yeah, well, besides that though. <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, it's, um, I think it's uh, interesting. Many, many systems involving economics are dynamic complex systems. So they're hard to reason about or predict the system behavior because it partly involves humans and reaction and how they behave in the market. So I think a lot of things were uncertain that became clearer over time to everybody, really. Were you paying attention to just the macroeconomic environment around you, the thing, the current events happening, and how that might have a connection to Bitcoin's use cases? Yeah, I mean, I was very interested in economics and like global macro, what's going on with the economy. I was following a lot in 2008, actually, with the financial crash. There was a lot to read about what was happening there. And Probably some of that, you know, didn't fully unwind. So we're experiencing still some of the 2008 financial uh, side effects even now. Um, so I mean, if, you know, as I said, like the, I wasn't originally in trying to work on eCash before Bitcoin, thinking about the monetary use case or the investment asset use case. But I think it's pretty clear that Bitcoin, being both an electronic cash payment system and an investment asset class helped its adoption. You know, people would come in through different use cases and get attracted to the other use cases. I mean, with your background as a computer scientist, what do you think is the most impressive aspect of Bitcoin from a programming standpoint? Is it difficulty adjustment, is it? Yeah, I mean, I think the difficulty adjustment it was one of the missing things. You know, so B-Money and Bitgold had kind of ideas, but I think they weren't as decentralized and automated. So I, th I think the key thing that people were missing before, and like people tried, right? They just didn't, didn't find the solution, is that you have to forget about stable coins and stable pricing and fix the rate of supply and not try and like fix, fix the inflation, like the price inflation, just fix the supply and let the free market deal with the rest. And so if somebody had articulated that thought clearly in 1997, I think people would have figured it out, probably. And there's a lot of um, cleverness about Bitcoin in sort of neatly combining multiple things, you know, the proof of work for transaction processing, the mining of new coins into existence. So there's kind of multiple uses. The other thing that I think I came to have a view over time is that um, you know, when, the, when there's some new technology, often people's expectation and intuition, which is reasonable, is, oh, this is the first version. There will be more and better things later. And, but that's not always the case. And it seems like Bitcoin is one of those areas where basically there's not that much room to improve it. 
which is counterintuitive. And you know, I spent some months trying to, you know, how I came to the realization is I tried to improve it and like found that pretty much anything you change made something else worse. So I was like, oh, okay, it's it exists in a um, kind of narrow design space where you know thing variants of it don't work very well. So it's kind of like a biological building block thing, right? So all of, all of uh, biological organisms are based on DNA with the same building blocks and you know you think well surely there should be life with lots of different building blocks but no like there's one yeah. and so it, it kind of seems a bit like that somehow which which people have trouble believing or it goes against like normal scientific intuition but as far as I can tell it seems to be the case. What do you say to people who look at Bitcoin and it feels so intimidating because of these very technical components and the, the programming that you, you have to really dig into to appreciate some of Bitcoin's features? I mean, what do you say to the average person? Um, well, I think Bitcoin is understandable at different levels. So, you know, I think you can, you know, get a reasonable working understanding without being particularly technical, just, you know, I mean, people make different analogies, but like, you know, it's like digital gold and, you know, that will do them for a while and they can, and I think things also changed over time. If you look at like news segments that were aired in 2012, 2013, the conversation was one-sided, like the, the person talking about Bitcoin was almost apologetic about how crazy an idea this was, and then, and the, you know, the the interviewer was very skeptical about, you know, you crazy internet guys, this will never go anywhere, uh, you guys are deluded. This kind of theme, right? And now it's kind of turned around. So, the, the apologeticness seems to be on the other side, which is, well, I don't, I'm sorry, but I'm, you know, not fully up to speed. Can you explain it to me? So there's an assumption that the assumption is reversed, like it exists, and so I think that's kind of like you know, business and social peer pressure, right? That, you know, big businesses, public market companies are doing things with Bitcoin. There are lots of individuals so that, you know, everybody knows somebody that knows something about Bitcoin. And so the assumption that while it must be valid, it must be useful because the social proof is, is there. And that's the difference. So I think that, that makes people I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but more inclined to accept simplified explanations up front, just on trust. And realistically, you know, society is complex and we use lots of complex technology, so nobody really understands everything about everything they use day to day, like mobile right. phones, cars, you know, flying on airplanes. There's lots of complex things we don't understand and we just accept. Even money itself, I think, you know. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about Bitcoin is that it leads people to learn about and re-examine what money is because I think you know a lot of people get by without really understanding much about fractional reserve banking and how that works. So did that have an impact on you how, you know being in that process of also learning about the history of money and how our system has developed to become kind of corrupt due to centralization and this concentration of political and economic power? Um, well I was already a bit exposed to that through trading and investing to, to realize that you're really in a battle to, I mean, investing is in a battle to preserve your spending power and the like inflation rate is politically manipulated to sound, to sound lower. They keep changing the definitions and exclude obvious costs. Like in the UK at the time, uh, they had taken housing costs out of the consumer price index, which is, you know, people are spending 50% of their yeah. disposable income on housing and you've taken out the consumer price index. That doesn't seem reasonable. And so those things are like politically manipulated. But if you're trying to invest, your benchmark should be to preserve your spending power in assets or you know, something real. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the realization that inflation is taxation, is, is, is a form of taxation and that it's actually more relatively challenging to even achieve a reliable, real uh, return on investment is quite difficult. You know, people can accidentally be losing money and not realize it for periods of time. So it sounds like there was an evolution. You saw it. You saw Bitcoin first as an electronic cash system, then a store of value, and then potentially was there a moment for you where you thought, oh, this could be the next global reserve currency. Well, I mean, th that was uh, Saifedean's Amuse's um, Bitcoin Standard book, which is kind of leaping ahead to say, well, maybe this can become 
you know, a return to a commodity money based financial system. And, you know, it's, it seemed to me like far in the future and that it was safer and more and good enough to think about Bitcoin as a gold competitor with some advantages, you know, like um, transportability, verifiability, and the fact that it's electronic, you can transmit it at a distance. Some advantages and, and the disadvantage being less history of acceptance, right? And less kind of um, market acceptance. So um, now, you know, whether, whether it will go beyond that, we don't know. But of course, the current macroeconomic situation uh, makes that more plausible because inflation is being thought about and discussed by a much wider range of people as in the news and globally governments have got themselves into a kind of sticky position where it's not clear how they can get out of the uh, monetary expansion inflation like if they increase interest rates that's bad for the economy if you don't increase interest rates asset price inflation gets ahead of everything, people become poorer in real terms. It's a bit of a tailspin and they, uh, I think they're just stuck between a rock and a hard place. And, and the other kind of uh, interesting phenomena is, I, mean, I think things have evolved in the last few years since COVID basically. And- Oh yeah, game so, theory playing out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the um, reserve currency of the world has changed historically and the prospect that the US could lose its reserve currency status seemed pretty remote. Mm -hmm. But I think recent developments have made that seem less implausible. And of course, if that changes, that's a whole different ball game. And you know, the, sanction, like, the sanctions seizing sovereign, uh, you know, foreign reserves of sovereigns is, is not good for confidence in fiat currencies at all. So I think that you know, whether it's Bitcoin or other commodities, it means people are going to place more faith in real assets for a store of value, I think. So tell us about how you came to create Blockstream. You're the CEO and you're doing so many innovative things in the space. I want to talk about some of the like satellite mining you're doing. So tell me more about Blockstream. Yeah, so Blockstream, I mean, as, as I was saying, the when I got more involved in Bitcoin in 2013, I tried to improve the privacy with confidential transactions and then I realized that it, it was a relatively complex change and hard for Bitcoin to just sit straightforwardly adopt. And so I turned my attention to trying to improve Bitcoin's modularity so that you could have kind of opt-in more advanced features, which is where the sidechain concept came from. So that's, that's what Blockstream was uh, founded to do, to kind of build out the infrastructure around sidechains. And part of that was mining too, because uh, you know, one of the concepts of sidechains is that you could merge mine them. So we were thinking that doing some mining would be, would be a good part of that plan, basically. So what is Blockstream? For people not familiar with the company, what do you guys do? Well, we do many, many things to do with yeah. Bitcoin. Many things. <laughs> um, so basically anything interesting or technically challenging to do with Bitcoin, we get in there and uh, try and improve things. So you know, we're doing some physical mining, we provide hosting for other people. We do mining for ourselves. Uh, with our recent B round, we acquired Spondulus, which is an Israeli mining manufacturer. So now we're you know, in the early stages of uh, building our own uh, Bitcoin miner as well. And we do a lot of protocol work. So um, we have some contributors to Bitcoin itself. Uh, we have a lightning development team, the core lightning team, formerly known as Sea Lightning. Uh, which is one of the main three implementations, because there are more than that, but originally there were three implementations. And we also do Liquid, which is a, a different layer two, sort of similar to Lightning, but for more for assets. It has confidential transactions in it, and it's a side chain, so it demonstrates the modularity uh, concept. So I was able to get that privacy tech deployed in a with Bitcoin denomination in a, in a side chain. So that was a awesome. kind of, achieve that yeah. kind of target and keep going. I want to hear more about the satellites because I find those to be so interesting and I'm curious how they really help reinforce the strength and the resiliency of the network. Yeah, so I think um, 
One area where Bitcoin has a reliance is on um, having a global unified view of the network. So if, if you were to get partitioned from the network, so if you're on an island and somebody broke the undersea cable and you were doing mining on the island, you might not realize that you were kind of accepting transactions that would be later rejected when the network reconnects. So your node would be isolated? Yeah, I mean, you could, you could basically end up with two Bitcoin networks that were not aware of each other, and that would be a bad thing. So generally for businesses that are, and individuals that are doing high value Bitcoin things, it's good for them to have redundant, like extra networks. And so the satellite is a very uh, redundant form of networking because it's using completely different infrastructure. It's, it's not reliant on local power or fixed line connections and things like that. And so what it does is it broadcasts globally real-time Bitcoin transactions, the Bitcoin block history, so you can sync a full node actually over the satellite. It takes a week or two, but you can sync it from scratch. And we also transmit uh, lightning uh, gossip information, so a, a big chunk of data there as well. Wow. So I know your company's moving aggressively forward with satellite mining and battery mining. You made an announcement at the Bitcoin conference about a big company coming in, so can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, we, we announced that Blockstream and uh, Block, formerly Square, are doing a, um, a joint project to build uh, solar and battery powered mining and to doing it in an open source way where people can look at the financial projections and the real time data. And what, what, we're announcing, what we announced at, that, at the same time was the supplier of the uh, the battery technology and the solar technology, which is Tesla. Wow. So what, what are your thoughts on Elon Musk? Because he's been kind of, you know, bullish on Bitcoin and people are still grateful that he's in the space, came in, and I think the price shot up as a result of, of him being a buyer. But then he, you know, was talking about Dogecoin. Now he's investing a ton in Twitter. I mean, what are your general takes on him? Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's, he's a kind of mixture of uh, hardcore science guy and a practical joker. So that's the way I read the, uh, the old coin jokes. And the, the Twitter movie might be interesting. I think he might be trying to reduce the sort of um, censorship and partisan political views. You think so? Lead, I think so, yeah. Why do so, we need that? Well, I mean, coming from the privacy tech background, I, I really dislike censorship of uh, free discussion and you know for of course you know the the service providers that get involved in moderation or censorship uh, have their arguments but it's very hard for them to do that in an impartial way so I think the best thing to do is to you know let people have free discussion and you know then you can look at the uh, the arguments on either side, right? Uh, many, many things are not black and white or the, the technology or the science and understanding of it is evolving over time. So it's, it's potentially risky actually to censor um, you know, opposing views about current understanding of something because current understanding is often limited and changes as you know, more statistics or new uh, theories are proven or disproven. Adam, what are you watching for right now? I think we're in such an interesting time where we have this macroeconomic backdrop that on the one hand is so bullish for Bitcoin, right? Because it's all these use cases playing out on a global stage in major crises in different countries, but then sort of bearish in the sense that our economy, you know, we need to raise interest rates. We're, we're headed toward a recession potentially. We have record high debt to GDP. We can't raise interest rates at the level we need to. So, I mean, what are you watching for? What are your, I guess, questions about Bitcoin going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate in the sense, I mean, people will say that, you know, all these different things are good for Bitcoin. And some of them are quite negative things for society at large, like, you know, the, the inflationary environment, prospect of higher interest rates or not higher interest rates and high inflation that runs out of control. That's pretty bad for, you know, for everybody. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I sort of believe in free markets and bottom-up unilateral solutions. So I think that, you know, it's hard to, I mean, central planning basically doesn't work. The, the market is too complex, dynamic for that to work. And so 
you know, at least with an asset like Bitcoin, if people can manage the volatility, get accustomed to that, that it has so far proven to be a pretty good hedge against inflation. And, and you're also benefiting from an adoption curve. Of course, short term, the volatility is something else to experience. But you know, if you've been doing stock trading, you would have got used to, you know, I mean, I think one, one thing that is interesting is that this concept of uh, difference between a speculator and an investor. Yeah. So an investor, if, if the price of the thing they're interested in buying a commodity or a Bitcoin or a share falls, they're great. Like, let's buy some more because they believe in the fundamental value. And so the opportunity to buy more at discount is, is positive to them. Whereas a speculator is just trying to, you know, get a return. And so if the price falls, maybe they'll sell, hope to buy it back later and maybe time it wrong. So it, it's uh, relatively risky to uh, speculate with Bitcoin, particularly with leverage, which some people do. And, and so the, I guess you could view the Bitcoin market as a battle between the speculators and the investors. So are you one of the people who feel that we are on the precipice of potentially a massive crash and sort of this fourth turning where we will usher in a new financial order? I don't know. It's it's looking more like that in the last couple of years than it did before, for sure. Um, I mean, I guess we are blessed to live in interesting times, as the Chinese proverb goes. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, in, it's a very interesting time for Bitcoin, of course. and. A lot of the metrics to do with Bitcoin have been uh, positive for months in a row, really, you know, like in terms of um, sort of adoption and announcements and on-chain metrics of, you know, coins leaving exchanges, this kind of thing. So, Do you see any threat to Bitcoin? Um, I mean, I think the threat has diminished quite a lot. Um, so there is safety in numbers in, you know, number of people who are interested and own it. And of course there are people spread out all through society inside big businesses, governments, political organizations who are Bitcoin owners, right? And so, you know, then they have a financial incentive to protect, protect their investment and philosophically to see it succeed. Um, so, you know, certainly in 2014, when Blockstream started, it was a more uncertain world in terms of how regulators would react to Bitcoin. But, you know, I think that has grown slowly and the regulatory risks have subsided substantially. So if you could have a platform that speaks to all American families to tell them how much to allocate, like the average American family today with inflation and the fact that most people don't even have money to save, how much would you tell them to allocate to Bitcoin? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to advocate for people to invest in something if they are kind of, you know, if they don't have much savings buffer, right? And that's, that's a challenge with the emerging markets too. But I think it's useful to look at Bitcoin as a long investment horizon investment. And there's an interesting statistic that over a four year period, the uh, moving average of Bitcoin has never fallen. And you know, the current four year moving average is 20 to $21,000 at the moment, compared to the market price, 45, 46, wherever we are right now. So it's kind of ratio and if that has proven to be a flaw, it's, you know, it's, the price is relatively low compared to that flaw at the moment. So, I mean, I think one, one way to combat the volatility risk is to just have a long-term horizon and look at the 200-week or four-year moving average as you know, the, the value and the rest is like volatile. And, and if, you, if you keep buying that, then with that outlook, then you're less you know, agitated by five or ten percent moves either way. But if I mean, as far as an average family, would you say they should have today like five percent of their wealth, ten percent, twenty, fifty? Well, I mean, yeah, I would say like five or ten percent is good. And of course, many people in Bitcoin end up with much bigger percentages yeah. because maybe gross. they started and it grew, or 
so their percentage changed or they also you know got more convinced about it and invested more of a time so a combination as well I think that happens to people it's been so interesting as I talk to people even here at the conference it's like I meet obviously most people are maxis and they're either hundred percent in or maybe they're ninety percent in or because of the macro environment we're seeing it's like oh I'm 70 30 I have cash because Bitcoin's gonna go down and I'm gonna buy in are you, where are you at with this oh I was <laughs> I'm always a permeable so I'm always like uh, very deep in Bitcoin okay <laughs> Well, and I have to ask you because, I mean, you were the first person to receive an email from Satoshi. There have been articles written or claiming that you could be Satoshi Nakamoto. So, I don't know, can you dispel that? Is that a myth? Like, could you be yeah. Satoshi Nakamoto? No, it's, it's a myth. <laughs> and, I mean, of course, people are looking for people who had the right uh, kind of technical interests, which, you know, a number of people did. Um, but... I'm not Satoshi, and uh, the, I mean the other thing that is kind of um, sort of documentary evidence is that if you look at the when I got more actively involved in Bitcoin in 2013, there are online discussion forums where when you at that time there was less technical documentation. If you want to know more, you'd have to go and ask developers and people. So you know, there's lot, lots of dumb questions as I was catching up in 2013. I think there are logs of those, so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think any Bitcoin developers are remotely convinced that I'm Stoshi, so I think that, and those are the guys that should know better, right? Like, they understand the system and stuff. So. All right, well, I know you're on many short lists, so. Um, I guess as we start to wrap up, just what is your vision or hope for a world under the Bitcoin standard? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, very interesting things about Bitcoin that we haven't talked about so far is the sort of shift of people's viewpoint from um, consumerist behavior to a savings and a long-term outlook behavior. And I've, I've talked to people who said that that was the most kind of beneficial part of uh, getting involved in Bitcoin that they thought or for the average person. Um, because I think it's actually more healthy for a society to, to have a long-term view, to think about the future and you know, save and invest rather than spending. Um, and in a, in a sense, you know, people, people will talk about the, um, the mining cost of Bitcoin, but apart, apart from the other arguments about that, um, you know, money, money doesn't, it's a closed system, right? So money that gets spent on buying Bitcoin would have otherwise been spent elsewhere. And if you look at the average person's spend, it would have been spent on a lot of consumer goods with a very short uh, lifetime that end up in landfills. And so, you know, Bitcoin is, because of the sort of, you know, pulling people towards a more long-term savings, value-oriented outlook, it's actually reducing, you know, consumption of uh, short lifetime consumer goods, I think. One of the things I love about Bitcoin is you just never stop learning. So, what is something that you're learning right now in the space? within your work in Bitcoin? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, there are always new things that people realize about, you know, ways to simplify or to improve. And Bitcoin's changes since it was released, I think are really sort of optimizations and opt-in features. I think people don't, a lot of people don't have intuition and they think that, you know, either Bitcoin hasn't changed and it's still running the same, or that it could be changed. And I think that's the wrong message. You know, what, what actually happens is that the changes to Bitcoin are optimizations and opt-in improvements. And all of the, you know, the fundamental things like the supply of coins, the maximum number of coins, proof of work, the block interval, the halving, all these things are invariant and are not, uh, not gonna change, I would say.